Welcome back to Unprecedential, AEI's podcast on American constitutionalism. This is Adam White, and I'm joined, as always, uh, remotely with my colleague and friend, Tal Ford Kang. Tal, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm glad I didn't have to uh, put on a suit uh, to speak with a federal judge today. I was afraid of uh, that that would happen. And then I read, well, I don't, I don't want to spoil your introduction, but I read Judge <laughs> Kethledge's uh, Ambiguities in Agency Cases ah. uh, paper, which... Uh, yeah. Quote, uh, I saw that eight other students on the panels were wearing suits, whereas I was wearing jeans and a T-shirt and that stretched right. my fears. And here I am <laughs> uh, fresh off a game of wiffle ball with my brothers. But I did have the decency Good. to change out of my University of Wisconsin hat for, uh, That's for a couple right. of Big, Big Ten, Ten. guys. Big Ten's good. <laughs> well, Tal, uh, you can save the suits for the clerkship interview someday. Um, uh, you know, as, as I was walking into the, my office to start taping this, I saw the sign we keep in our kitchen, the running tally of days we've been in quarantine, uh, at least the kids, since the kids have been out of school. And mm-hmm. we're, in, we're now in day uh, 47 of, of this, this strange era we're living in. We're recording this, by the way, in, in late April. Um, and so in reflecting on in the last few weeks, especially on this strange situation we found ourselves in, I, I found myself going back and, and rereading a, a fascinating book on work and solitude that was first published in 2017 titled Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. Uh, for our audience, we recommend this book very, very highly. It's a remarkable meditation on the need for solitude in our hyper-networked information age. I first learned of this book because one of its two authors, Judge Raymond Kethledge, is a federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. And now it's my pleasure to welcome him to the show. Hello, Judge Kethledge. Thank you, Adam. It's great to be here. Judge, there's so much in this book to discuss, and, and there's some broader themes, too, about the work of a judge, and especially the work of the judge in, in our modern sort of form of government that we'll get to. Why don't we start, even before we talk about how this book arose, let's just mm-hmm. start with the, the basic point of it all. This is, this is a book about solitude. What does solitude mean? Well, the way we define it in the book is, I guess, a little different, perhaps, than the way uh, we use that term in ordinary uh, conversation. Um, it, does not be, it does not mean being physically alone. It means uh, being alone with your thoughts, as we put it in the book, an absence of input from other minds. So you could be, you could be physically alone. And I think this is more common than ever now. You could be physically alone and yet not in solitude because you're looking at your phone, uh, where in all likelihood you're getting some very superficial inputs that are keeping you from doing any serious thinking, introspection, reflection. Um, On the other hand, you could be among other people. You could be walking in a park and thinking about a specific subject, working through a specific problem in your mind. Um, You could be, sometimes when I'm in Cincinnati for oral arguments, if I have an especially hard case the next day, sometimes I'll just go out to dinner by myself and bring some case materials with me and look at those. And at some point during dinner, uh, just put them aside and think about the case. Um, A lot of times when we think about a subject in a different setting than we're used to being in, it jogs you out of your usual mental ruts and prompts more creative, dynamic thinking. I, I find that that does happen when I do this in a restaurant, but I've got people all around me, and that's very much solitude as we define it. Well, of course, this isn't just a book about sort of meditation for its own sake, right? Or solitude for its own sake. It's solitude also as a means to certain ends. And as your book says, the mm-hmm. title indicates, Lead Yourself First. It's a, it's a book on leadership, not just leading others, but in preparing ourselves to, to mm-hmm. do whatever work our career, vocation, or job calls for. And for those who haven't read the book yet, it's, it's a fascinating study of, of a series of, of famous people and the ways in which they sort of illustrate the, the use of solitude towards different ends, right? Solitude for the sake of clarity, creativity, emotional balance and moral courage. Mm-hmm. And in this book, yeah. Judge, you, it's just a fascinating array of characters, Lincoln, Grant, Eisenhower, and, and uh, uh, Churchill, all the way to Jane Goodall, uh, John Paul II, mm-hmm. um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, 
why don't you just tell us in, in somewhat briefly, because uh, to explain this book would, would sure. you know, we can't do justice to it in an hour, but, yeah. but what are the main themes that you have to, to convey in terms of how solitude um, is useful towards each of those ends? Or if you could just pick one maybe as an example um, yeah. of, of the value well, of solitude. I mean, uh, Mike and I, my friend, Mike Irwin, who uh, is my co-author, Mike and I spent, seven years actually between the time the date when we decided to write the book and when it actually got published and a lot of that time went into thinking about specifically what does solitude do for us and then you know what qualities does it enhance and eventually we identified clarity the ones you said just now um and uh and so you know clarity breaks down into analytical clarity, intuitive clarity. Uh, both of those require mental isolation. Uh, just to, I guess, focus on one example, analytical clarity, that's very hard earned. It is the result of rigorous syllogistic thinking. Um, it's just like arduous exercise for your brain. And I, I think that that kind of thinking can only happen when you're alone, when when you don't have, when you're not being interrupted by inputs from other people. And it tends to, it, it needs to be sustained. You can't cycle in and out of that very easily. So that is, uh, you know, that's something that really happens only in solitude. Um, uh, emotional balance, I mean, there are, in the book, we talk about a number of different ways that, uh, you know, whether it's catharsis or reflecting on the reasons why someone might be acting in a way that's aggravating you, um, uh, different ways that solitude can, can bring magnanimity and through that bring uh, emotional balance. Rather than be angry at someone, you can have some sympathy or at least sort of forgive them for what they're doing. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I can't cover the whole the whole book and and each one each uh, theme and, and the reasons for it. But you know, I'm happy to go through it in the call. Well, we'll we'll get back to uh, Churchill is a particularly fascinating example that I want to get back to later. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the first time I picked up your book, just based on the title, you know, I thought, well, there's surely there's going to be you know Lincoln in here. But some of the examples you picked were just fascinating, the ways you explored them. One in particular, um, the story of Jane Goodall, who studied, yeah. uh, you know, studied apes. Um, and, and you mentioned, I think, in your books, in the book, maybe in the acknowledgments that this, this example was suggested to you by, by your daughter, was it? That's uh, correct, yeah. yeah. Won't you, yeah. Won't you we talk, explore the Jane Goodall example a little bit? Because yeah. This, is just, this one was really surprising and fascinating. Well, yeah, my daughter, uh, I think she was about six years old at the time now she's 18 but she uh in the uh very early in the process she suggested that i look up jane goodall uh my daughter loves animals and she loves reading as i said in the end of the book um so i mean one thing i'll say is obviously we, we wanted to have a balance of men and women as uh, among the historical subjects that we covered and it was it was harder to find women and i guess maybe that just tells you something about sort of you know um their ability to access leadership positions in, in parts of our history but in any event jane goodall is somebody who uh, first of all, she's a wonderful writer, an excellent stylist, and she's written a lot of a, a number of books that uh, memorialize her uh, experiences. And uh, one of them, Shadow a Man in particular, uh, describes her experience studying chimpanzees. No one had ever done that successfully before. And she had anticipated that she would be looking for them by herself uh, without other people around. And as it turned out, the, the local government in Tanzania required uh, her to, to be accompanied by three male scouts, which was very disappointing. And, and this is kind of both uh, intuitive clarity and creativity because at first, she looked for the chimps just the, the same way everyone else had in the past, and everyone else had failed. And that, that was to sneak up on them, to try to sneak up on them and observe them in the wild. 
And some, occasionally she would get a glimpse, but usually they would run off. And it, so after two weeks, it really wasn't going well. And then she had a, uh, a fit of malaria and she was laid up in her tent for five days. Finally, she felt strong enough to, to, to go hike back into the, the jungle. Um, and this time she just didn't, didn't ask the, the scouts to come with her. And she had had an intuition during that five days where she realized that their, their basic approach was wrong. And that if you approach an animal like a predator, they will flee. And she realized that when you approach a chimpanzee by stealth, you're approaching the chimp away the way a predator would, the way a leopard would in that same tropical forest. And so she decided just to sit out in plain view on top of uh, this crest. She called it the peak. And long story short, she sat there in plain view, just wearing khaki shorts and a khaki shirt. And a, a mother chimp came out with a juvenile on her back. And the mother chimp just sort of stopped and eyeballed her for a while and realized this person is or this animal isn't really uh, doing any, anything that seems uh, threatening. And within a couple of hours, she had uh, probably a couple dozen chimps in front of her. And it was that insight that she had in solitude, uh, that intuition to break away from a conventional norm, to do something different. And intuitive clarity allows us to see patterns. Uh, It's not, it's inductive reasoning from a bunch of data points. And we see a pattern and draw from that a principle. And what, what she had seen, you know, in her time in the tent, what she had intuited was that the pattern of their um, uh, observation of the chimps fit the pattern of a predator. She intuited that and she chose to break away from it. And that, that was the reason she succeeded where up until that time, nobody else ever had. There's a few different forms of solitude that are discussed in the book. And that's, that's one of them, right? The, the sort of sometimes even involuntary solitude sure. that marks a break in, in ways sort of work, right? Lawrence of Arabia was another example of this in the book where yeah, he, yeah. On, on his sickbed, had time to think. Then there are others. The solitude is the solitude spent over the course of years, right? Mm-hmm. Churchill, John Paul II, mm-hmm. and others mm-hmm. who over the course of years of study would 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 make time to sort of lay the foundation for things to come. Of course, um, in the the examples of sort of wartime leaders, Grant, Lincoln, uh, mm-hmm. and you begin with Eisenhower, it's the solitude mm-hmm. of forcing oneself into solitude in the middle of things from mm-hmm. time to time. Um, right. uh, could we talk about about Eisenhower, the example that you, uh, you opened the sure. book with? Actually, I want to yeah. point out when we said at the beginning of your Jane Goodall, um, discussion about, you know, looking for gender balance. One thing that occurred to me in reading the book, it was sort of the, the, the imbalance. Uh, and I don't mean that as a criticism. What I, mm-hmm. what I thought of, you know, is thinking it through was I was reminded of, of uh, Virginia Woolf's um, A Room of One's Own, right? And, and sometimes the special challenges that, that, that women might find in society in mm-hmm. in finding solitude. In fact, as I was rereading your book in preparation for the interview, there was plenty of times where I'd be quietly in my, my office listening to music in the background and reading and taking notes. And then I'd hear, you know, three of my kids run past the door and my mm-hmm. wife, you know, trying to manage all that. I sort of would think, you know, how sort of privileged I am to be able to, to, um, sort of claim solitude for yeah. my work. And so I, that's just a point of sort of acknowledging what, what you've acknowledged. Um, mm-hmm. I don't mean to dwell on it, um, but it was just, it, it occurred to me that a room, a room of one's own is sort of a, sort of a classic example of the challenges that, that women find. Yeah. In, in the, and it's, uh, that, I mean, that's a great privilege during this time in particular. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing that, that I know uh, that I'm very grateful uh, for is that in my home, uh, my wife and my two children who are adults and I, I mean, we have places we can go to get at least some solitude. Uh, it can always be interrupted. Um, but there are people living a couple miles from me in trailer homes and, uh, and they don't have a room of their own. And so 
it is that's one blessing that I count during this time is that I can get a little bit of solitude. Uh, but you asked about Eisenhower. About Eisenhower, yeah. Yeah, and so I mean Eisenhower. One reason I uh, I wanted to have him in the book is that he's a very strong extrovert, and and he really sort of belies the, the idea that solitude is only for introverts. Um, and Eisenhower, I mean, he was an extremely disciplined, self-disciplined person. And he had an insight relatively uh, early in his career that um, the, the, the best way to think about a problem is to write about the problem. And so he, uh, he during World War II, as busy as he was, and he, is, he was surely busier than probably any of us and anybody listening to this podcast ever will be in their lives. I mean, he was extremely busy throughout the war, but he, he did whatever it took to carve out periods of solitude where he had a practice of writing memoranda to himself simply as a way of thinking through the very complex problems that he addressed. Now, the book focuses, or sort of that chapter in the book culminates with a memo he writes to himself on June 3rd, 1944, about D-Day and about he's trying to come up with a guiding principle he can use in the moment to determine whether to go or not go in the next 48 hours. But one story I love about Eisenhower happens at the very outset of the war where he's a one-star general down in um, uh, San Antonio. He gets a phone call from Washington saying, the chief wants to see you tomorrow, being uh, you know, George C. Marshall, one of the most yeah. formidable Americans ever to, to you know, uh, stride the planet. And, and so he gets on a plane, flies to Washington, is picked up at the, at the plane, at the, at the you know, runway. Um, it's driven to Marshall's office. He hasn't even unpacked his bag. And this, I should say, this is three days, I think it, it was, after Pearl Harbor. And so he's escorted into Marshall's office. He's with George C. Marshall alone. He know, he's met Marshall a couple times, but, you know, Marshall was... Marshall, just extremely formidable. Marshall has no preamble whatsoever, goes into a 20-minute rec recitation of the disastrous position of the United States forces in the Pacific, and then turns to Eisenhower, who hasn't even unpacked his bag, and says, what do you think should be our line of action? <laughs> and so Eisenhower has the presence of mind to say, can I think about it? Yeah. And Marshall said yes. And so Eisenhower goes off to an empty office and writes the first of these many memos to himself. Uh, this one, I guess, he gave to Marshall as well. But he writes his first memo during the war entitled Steps to be Taken. And, and this was all a test for Eisenhower. Marshall was testing him to see what he would come back with. And basically, Eisenhower comes back to uh, Marshall about an hour later and says, the situation is hopeless, uh, but our allies in the region will be watching what, what we do. They will forgive failure, but they will not forgive abandonment, and we must do everything we can to save, our, our, you know, uh, save the Philippines. And Marshall said, I agree with you. Do everything you can to save them. And so that was the first of many memos. And, um, you know, and he, uh, he stood up to George C. Marshall to carve out some time for solitude. And if he can do that, I think most of us can stand up to our phones to take some time for solitude as well. Um, your, your discussion of Eisenhower actually brought to my mind another book that came out just a couple of years before yours. It was David Brooks's book, The Road to Character, where Eisenhower is a case study in that book, too. And it's a, it actually illustrates another one of your lessons of solitude, um, the catharsis aspect mm -hmm. of emotional balance. Um, and there was a story that Brooks focused on, and he wrote about it elsewhere in columns and so on, about Eisenhower having such trouble as a young man um, maintaining his, his, keeping his temper that um, his, his mother told him he really needed to 
work on this. And he developed a habit of, um, to work out anger. He would even that he continued, I guess, into adulthood where he would write down the names of people, you know, that were sort of frustrating him and he'd write them <laughs> yeah. down and then, and then he would tear it. He would tear up the note and he would throw it away. Um, mm-hmm. almost sort of like the, uh, not just grants using solitude for catharsis, but also Lincoln, mm-hmm. yeah, right? Sure. Uh, your tale Very of Lincoln much. and, and the letter that he, he wrote to, was a general Mead, Mead, Mead right? Yeah. That never that he never sent, and and yep. so um, anyway, I thought your your sl- your selection of Eisenhower to open the book was really fortuitous. You made a the a, whole a just, the oh, whole please, thing about the whole thing about catharsis. You know, antecedent to that is self awareness, yeah. and and self awareness comes from introspection. So both Lincoln and Grant and Eisenhower they were introspective enough in the first instance to know that they had this, you know, unresolved emotion. And then each of them in different ways deliberately chose solitude to resolve that emotion. And so all of that from the introspection and to the manner in which they dealt with the emotion, all of that happened in solitude. Yeah, you, you made a, a, a joke a moment ago about even in this sort of technological age, and you mentioned earlier about, about phones and so on. One of the themes that recurs through your book is sort of the challenges of the, of the modern information age, right? This idea that mm-hmm. solitude is, yeah. is harder than ever to find when we we're, we constantly sort of open ourselves up to the phone calls, the emails, the texts, Twitter, yeah. and and on and on. Um, you had a, a quote from, from Jim Mattis who went on, I suppose to be yeah. after you interviewed him, he went on to be secretary of defense. We well, talked to him in 2011. He was really? 35,000 feet above Afghanistan. Mike Irwin, uh, was really the preeminent expert on Southern Afghanistan when he left the country in 2009. Yeah. And so he had tight connections with Petraeus and Mattis. Yeah. I mean, who better to, who better to interview on this, right? Than the warrior monk, uh, Jim oh, Mattis. And you oh, he about, was great. He about uh, about tr- how he would travel with his his collect his thousand book library, yeah. Um, in order to preserve sort of that. He, he, anyway, you quote him in the book as saying, "If I was to sum up the single biggest problem of senior leadership in the information age, it's a lack of reflection, and mm-hmm. and, and that lack of reflection, which is is really exacerbated by all the things that that occupy our our attention." Yeah, two two quotes I've always kept with me. Um, for, for a long time, ever since reading actually the article that you mentioned, the acknowledgments that sort of helped to inspire this book, which we'll yeah. get back to. Um, it was a quote from, from Hemingway, I think in, in, in a Paris Review interview, he said, the telephone and, and visitors are the work destroyers. Um, and then around a few, about a decade later, John Dos Passos, the novelist, said, all you need is a room without any particular interruptions. And of course, today we have mm-hmm. many more interruptions and many more work destroyers. So yeah. could, could you say a few, a little bit about, about that aspect, about all this, sure. all the things that we grapple with today that make the problem yeah. worse? I mean, that, that really, these developments are really what created the urgency to write this book in, in the view of Mike and myself. Uh, I mean, in times past, solitude came naturally to most of us. Um, you know, when you're, you know, when I was an undergraduate walking to class or when you're driving a car or you're waiting in a, in a longer than usual line at the grocery store or something, I mean, you would just naturally uh, start thinking about something. And sometimes it would be, you know, some more focused reflection. Other times it might be just sort of, you know, free thought, but that's often where intuition comes to the surface. Yeah. And, um, and, and with, the, with the development of these handheld devices, they have filled up all of the interstitial spaces of life that would otherwise be times of, uh, you know, just even smaller episodes of solitude, introspection. They've filled those spaces with tweets and, you know, you know, breaking news and all the, all the flotsam and jetsam that comes onto our phones, uh, through, you know, from wherever. Um, and these, I mean, the phones and the applications themselves are designed to be addictive. Cal Newport has written about this, digital minimalism, he writes about this. I mean, they're, they're quite deliberately designed to be addictive, and we get addicted to them. I, I've seen people 
I've known for years, progressively become addicted to their phones and they're just constantly looking at a phone or an iPad. And so not only do these devices crowd out the interstitial, interstitial time for reflection and introspection, but they actually start taking away the big stretches of time that we might otherwise use for solitude. And instead, we are now just looking at whatever applications and websites we've come, become addicted to. So solitude now takes a conscious choice and it takes discipline, whereas in the old days, it used to come naturally. And that means we have to be aware of its benefits and we have to have, our, we have, to have the discipline to put the devices down and pursue solitude's benefits or else we're just, it's going to, we're losing solitude without it even realizing it. You mentioned a couple of times your co-author, Michael Irwin, um, and, and, you know, you came up with in the book, you mentioned that you, you, you two came up with this book while this, while having a chat in an Irish pub where there isn't always yeah. solitude, but there's always, there's often a lot of introspection. Um, <laughs> uh, could you just tell us a little bit about your co-author? Um, sure. Yeah. yeah. Mike is Mike's Mike and I are opposites in, in some ways. Mike's a, a very strong extrovert. I'm a pretty strong introvert. Neither of those things has anything to do with social functioning. It's just whether you gain or lose energy going to say a conference. Um, but so he's an extrovert. He's, he is one of the highest energy people I know and uh, I'm not. So um, uh, we complement each other in some ways. Uh, he actually is an ultra marathon runner. He's done a bunch of 54 milers. He's a West Pointer. He uh, did three deployments in the Middle East, one, his first one to Iraq, his second two to uh, uh, Afghanistan. He's an intelligence officer. And the, the way Mike and I came upon the idea of, of writing the book was we were having a, a couple of Guinness uh, outside on the porch at this uh, Irish pub. It was a few doors down from my office. And, and Mike talked about how when he was, uh, I think he was a, a first lieutenant when he was in Iraq uh, on his first deployment. And he chose to walk about a mile each way to the chow hall in temperatures around 100 degrees, just because he intuited, like Eisenhower did, that he needed that time alone. His base was subject to rocket and mortar attacks. And sometimes he just needed that time to steady himself, get emotional balance. Other times he had to think about leadership challenges he had. He was leading 12 people at that time and, you know, at a FOB, Ford Operating Base. Um, so he chose to do that. And I talked about how I have this barn office in northern Michigan where I always say I get 20 extra IQ points and I write a lot of opinions up there. And, uh, and so it was our respective experiences in solitude that inspired us to, to go ahead and do this. Um, and, you know, Mike, Mike was in Ann Arbor because he was getting his master's degree in leadership psychology. So he's got an educational background as well as a uh, his own experience as a leader. Um, so he's a, he's a great American and a, and a great friend. His, his arrival in Michigan was, was involuntary, so to speak, right? He, he was yeah, sent was. by the military to yeah. get his advanced degree. It was, wasn't necessarily solitude, so to speak, but it was certainly a removal from, from, from the action he was really accustomed yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. He came from Helmand province. Yeah. And like I said, he really was probably the, the military's leading expert on the Taliban in Southern Afghanistan, Helmand and uh, Kandahar uh, at that time. And he got orders just as they were starting the surge, the smaller surge under president Obama in Afghanistan, he got orders to come to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And that was a very tough transition for him to go from that environment and what they were dealing with there. And then being a graduate student environment and see what some of the graduate students thought were actually significant problems. It was a world apart in a big transition. Uh, but you know, he managed that partly through solitude. So you mentioned in the acknowledgement section of the book uh, that what spurred you to write, or at least spurred you to have the conversation that gave rise to the book, was uh, was an, an essay, originally a speech by Bill DeRizowitz on leadership and solitude, which had been preceded by an essay that he wrote for the American Scholar on solitude. And, and I remember these two essays myself when they came out about a decade ago. Um, they're, they're striking essays that I returned to 
um, yeah. for, from time to time. But I have to admit what, what actually brought me to your book when it first came out was the interview you gave with David Latt of uh, Above the Law.com. Oh, yeah. where great. you dis- Yeah, well, you discuss uh, where you sort of find solitude which uh, certainly resonates with my own preferred uh, experience in in solitude. Could you tell us about that? Oh, yeah. I'm always happy to talk about our place up north. Yeah, you call it the the barn office? Yeah. So I'm a lifelong, very avid outdoorsman, and particularly fishing I'm just crazy about. And so we have a, a, a home on Upper Lake Huron in a very rural area uh very undeveloped upper lake huron is very undeveloped just kind of small blue collar town scattered along the shoreline up there and uh so we've got four acres on on lake huron uh and we're just surrounded by woods on each side we don't have a structure for a quarter mile on either side actually and uh so i've got uh we've you know got our home up there and then i've got a barn with an office uh on its second floor looking out at the lake and uh and the hvac is a wood stove uh and most importantly we have no internet connection of any kind up at our place there we don't have cell service cable doesn't get back there and obviously we've chosen not to have satellite television and i just can't tell you how restorative it is to go up there for whatever amount of time we go up there and to be disconnected from all the Lilliputian inputs that we get from our phones and all of the toxicity that comes in from uh, the various media that, that we access through these devices. And you just find that it, you, you, you kind of return to a, a more natural focus on the moment around you and then, it, and then looking inside you as well. Uh, and, and, and kind of, you know, being present is sort of a vogue phrase, but, but you're, you're more engaged, more genuinely engaged with the people around you. One of the, you know, people in a two person conversation isn't looking at a phone. Um, and anyway, so in that barn office, I don't have any internet connection. And I noticed pretty early, and this would have been early in my career as a judge. And I would go up there I bring the hard copy materials I needed to write a hard opinion. I reserve this for like harder opinions. Yeah. And, and I would go up there with my laptop and no connectivity in the hard copy. And I just noticed that whatever I worked on in that office always seemed to go well. Yeah. And, and I just had this clarity in the office. And I thought about that. I introspected about it. And I realized it's because I don't, I don't have part of my brain wondering if I've gotten an email or should I check the emails or did, you know, somebody, uh, have I gotten a concurrence in this opinion or not? I'm totally cut off from that stuff. And after, uh, after maybe, you know, 12 to 24 hours, you, you break free of that and you stop thinking about it and you just focus on what you're doing. And, and I, my joke always is that I get 20 extra IQ points in that office because of the focus that I have on the work that I'm doing. And I truly believe that. I truly believe my nervous system is functioning markedly better there than it is when I'm in my chamber's office where, you know, I can check my email anytime. Um, and so that, that, it's my favorite place in the world. I always say our, our place up there generally. I haven't been able to go there. Our governor blocked us from going there for uh, for about a month. And um, and uh, but I'm going back up on March or uh, May six. So I, I can't wait for that. For for listeners who want to get a sense of this, um, go on to YouTube and look up the the TEDx talk that Judge Kethledge gave. Um, what was I think the University of Minnesota, maybe Michigan, um, of course. Michigan. Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, uh, but but the one slide you have in your presentation is a photo right. of you. That's of right. Us. And uh, it's, yeah. Or something it, your 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 sort of experience, and I sort of mentioned you know what why I, I like that interview you, where you explain this for the first time is my my wife's parents live in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Yeah, that's and great. Their place up uh, up in up, up by um, Land Lakes is is one of my favorite places in the world too. In part because of its you know limited connectivity, and when we go there in the summer, if we drive, and I'll take a banker's box full of papers. And I can usually write really much, much, much better yeah. there 
um, than I can um, mm-hmm. here in my home office. And your experience also reminded me of a, there's a new bo- a documentary out on Netflix about, uh, I mean, speaking of interruptions, now I'm talking about Netflix. But yeah, that's okay. there's a great, there's a great, a that's great doc- different. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a well, how is that different? How is that different? I mean, because it's, I mean, you can, you want to balance, you know, I'm not saying uh, you don't need to be thorough. I mean, one thing maybe I should make clear is that solitude comes in different forms and there's, you can have smaller episodes of solitude. Uh, Like when I drive to work, it's 30 minutes. And, and particularly when I'm working on an opinion, I try to think about a specific topic for that 30 minutes. One time I remember I was writing a dissent. The case was really good material, uh, not least the majority opinion. And well, I, I shouldn't say that, but but anyway, I, I knew that this case w- would lend itself to a really good opening line. And and so I thought, okay, I'm just going to think about the opening line, try to come up with it on the drive, and it worked. I mean, I remember it. It was like I remember it, I can see it in my mind right where I was on the highway. And the line was, well, I shouldn't say the line because then you'll know the majority. Right, right. Not, <laughs> I've said too much. Yeah. But, but yeah. you know, you can have longer episodes of solitude. Um, I used to camp by myself in the woods for a week after final exams in northern Michigan and fly fish. But solitude doesn't need to be this big production. Uh, you can have solitude just walking, you know, around the block. Uh, right now. So uh, anyway, I just want to make that clear. Oh, sure, sure. He, yes. Even Thoreau, by the way, it's not as though he lived at the lake constantly 24-7 for years. He would go back into the city and, and see people and and so on. Uh, the Netflix yeah. thing I was going to refer to was, was there's a great documentary on Bill Gates. It's a three-part miniseries. And they talk about his Think Week, where he goes off to a cabin. Same thing, no connectivity. Um, he comes with a bag full of books and mm-hmm. notepads, and he works through the things that he has to work through. Yeah, a good friend of mine who, uh, uh, who used to be in the Court of Appeals with me, who had a uh, cabin in a remote location, he would do what he called a reading week, where he would, uh, it was the week before he'd sit, and he would bring his hard copy materials, and he'd go back you know, to his cabin, and he'd just read everything he needed for the city. Well, let's talk a little about judges then and solitude. Uh, one judge makes an appearance in the book, um, Judge Frank Johnson of the Fifth Circuit, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. famous um, defender of civil rights. Um, but when you talk more generally about solitude facilitating structured thinking, that you, you mentioned that early on in the book. And, and so I, as I read the book, thinking through how would a judge need solitude, use solitude, the chapter that seemed sure. actually the most directly relevant was the chapter on Churchill and his writing of the speech on Munich, Mm -hmm. um, sort of how, first of all, he had dedicated so much of his life to sort of writing and thinking through things. But then when it comes time to write uh, something as serious as that speech, right? um, You say at one point in the book, a quote from the book, the process of writing a complex document for most writers, the most solitary of tasks forces one to think much harder about its subject than does editing a document written by someone else. Right. And, right. and, and so obviously judges do a lot of different kinds of writing and they don't always write um, the first drafts of all of their opinions. I know the mm-hmm. judge I clerked for the opinions that sort of, I won't say the most important opinions because obviously every case is important to the litigants, but there were some opinions where, where the judge I clerked for judge Santel would say that sure. he, needed, he needed to do this one from the start. Right. Um, to to yeah. sort of build it, build it up. So how, I mean, judging is a solitary task in so many ways, but, but the, this task of, of writing, how, how would you describe sort of the way you approach writing yeah. judicial opinions and mm-hmm. what it requires both in terms of the collaborative moments with, with your fellow judges, with clerks and, and those moments that call, require solitude? Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, there are two pieces. There's a clarity piece, and then on the back end, sometimes there's a moral courage piece. And I don't want to imply that I'm some profile in courage or judges or, you know, like privates on Omaha Beach. But sometimes you know you're going to take flack. And so sometimes there's a moral courage piece. But the clarity piece, I think, completely overlaps with uh, the practice of law for for attorneys. Uh, I know that from practicing myself for 15 years. And so 
I write my own published opinions precisely when I, I wrote that particular sentence that you read. And that really is based on my own experience that that is the, the, the way I can think hardest about a case is to write an opinion from a clean sheet of paper, not to edit a draft. Uh, and so if it's a published opinion, I'm going to write that from a clean sheet of paper. And so you start with this jumbled mass of information. Uh, I mean, the briefs try to put it in some kind of order, but you know that's a long way away from where you want to be in your opinion. Uh, and, and again, I think all of this tracks the process of writing a brief, but you start with this jumbled mass of information. You might have a bunch of record material. You might have uh, you know, a bunch of cases and within those some, some relevant passages and even with the, within those some like really good quotes that you know you want to use. Um, you might have statutory, you know, positive law materials. Uh, in my job, I've got the briefs themselves. So you've got this jumbled mass of information and you need to transform it into a landscape of logical premises. And that means you have to sort this information. You know, some is factual information, sort it within the factual landscape, sort the legal information. And what you start to see when you do that is that a lot of what seemed important when you were first learning about the case, uh, a lot of what seemed important when I'm first reading the briefs actually isn't very important. And when when you finally sort this information out and you start to construct a syllogistic uh, a chain of reasoning about your, uh, your legal decision, um, what I almost invariably find, and, and, and this is something I first noticed when I was a, a clerk for Judge Ralph Guy on the Sixth Circuit, is that there almost always seems to be what I call the nub of the case, that that this landscape of logical premises leads to a single critical variable, whether it's an interpretive variable about the meaning of a statute, whether it's, um, uh, you know, does this piece of evidence satisfy a certain standard? What does this one case mean? There's always this nub of the case and whichever way that breaks the case is going to go, the decision is going to go. And so, you know, that's that, that's how I uh, basically kind of do the outlining process is to, to take all those materials, break it to the syllogistic form that I'm talking about when I write an opinion is a detailed outline. Uh, and that is a painful, painful process. My daughter was just uh, a few days ago, she was writing, getting ready to write an English paper. And I told her, I said, now just remember you have to think until it hurts before you start writing. If it, do, if, if it doesn't hurt yet, you haven't thought enough before you start writing. And it's it, that whole process, building the opinion from the bottom up, makes me understand the case and think about the case much more deeply than I ever would if I just edited a draft. And so I have insights about the law and about the case itself that I'd never have if I didn't write the document all the way through. And that, you know, that just was precisely what Eisenhower saw in his experience. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it involves such hard work. I always chuckle when I see that famous line in Federal 78 um, about judges having neither force nor will, but merely judgment. And merely judgment um, so almost sort of sells it too short, right? In terms of the... Yeah. The, I mean, I, obviously, it's not, he's, he's, make, he's making a different point, but... but yeah. It's, yeah, it's or when um, it when yeah. in statutory interpretation, when you use what you call the tools of statutory construction, I mean, they are sort of real tool. you know, that you're doing real work. Um, I want to just pivot a little bit to something to two essays that you've written elsewhere to sure. you've given, um, because actually you're, you know, your retreats to, to, to Lake Huron, they make an appearance in a, in a, in a, paper that was published in the Vanderbilt Law Review, um, a, a talk yeah. you gave at the University of Michigan about right. statutory interpretation and statutory ambiguity. And you talk about how when you're, when you're duck hunting, right, uh, you might have to really pu push yourself through some thicket and you might decide that, well, the candle's not worth the fight. Um, and so you, you might not chase the, some particular ducks. Um, 
They're partridge, Some, actually. Oh, it was so, a partridge? Sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to correct you, but the, the metaphor only works with partridge because okay. a lot of times they're in these thick alder bushes that are really hard to push through. Right. I suppose if by the time the duck's in the water, you've, you've shot it. Um, yeah. But, well, but, I'm usually um, fishing on the water, so the ducks are safe for me. Okay. But um, you you talk about how in, the, in this, this Vanderbilt paper, you talk about how so many parts of administrative law actually seem to encourage judges not to do mm -hmm. the hard work yeah. they need to do, right? Yep. And this gets into these questions about statutory interpretation, Chevron, ambiguity. But this, this, this beginning with this, this, this talk that was again published in the Vanderbilt Law Review, I really recommend it to our listeners. You, you raise concerns that administrative law um, is encouraging judges to, to do a, a worse job than they really should do under their duty, right? By, by not mm -hmm. trying to resolve ambiguity. In fact, you mm -hmm. say at one point in this paper that you've never had to decide a case, a Chevron case in step two, because mm -hmm. if you work hard enough, you can find the, 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 the right meaning of the statute. Um, could you unpack this a little bit about these questions sure. you've raised about administrative law and the, and the duty of the judge? Sure. Um, well, I mean, my own experience has been that if you do the work necessary, if you work hard enough, usually there is one interpretation that is demonstrably better than any other. And that means that is the law. Uh, now, in agency cases, I mean, it, it, the statutes that we interpret in agency cases, I will grant, are a bear to interpret. And you, you find yourself, you kind of parachute into this tiny landing zone within this massive statute. And you have to kind of figure out where you're at. And you it takes a lot of work to understand the surrounding landscape. I understand that. Um, but, you know, I mean, even if one takes Chevron by its terms, uh, deference is supposed to be a last resort. Yeah. And, and, and so in my uh, ambiguities and agency cases speech that was uh, published in that Vanderbilt uh, article, um, what I talk about in part are what I call Chevron secondary effects, secondary effects on the agencies, secondary effects on the judiciary. And so the agencies all, I mean, what I can say, I'll just repeat what I said there. Uh, the, the secondary effect on the agency, the effect of deference, the habituation to deference has led to a degree of hubris from the civil, uh, civil appellate division of the Department of Justice that I never anticipated seeing as a federal judge. It's the biggest surprise that I encountered on the bench, and it happens over and over and over again. They're almost indignant when you challenge their interpretation. And their first answer almost always is, well, you owe us deference. And my answer is, no, I don't. <laughs> Not until we determine as judges that the tools of uh, uh, you know statutory construction don't lead us to an answer and we're a long way from that right. um and so you know the agency briefs often skip step one entirely and just say on this issue you know it's well settled that we owe them deference and you know they're really missing the first part of chevron but as to the judiciary so you know these are really hard statutes they tend to be kind of arid not you know not the most sort of uh, interesting material sometimes and and so the the analogy or the metaphor i used in the speech was it's like you know you, you think there's a partridge in the really dense alder tag bushes um but and but you're gonna have to push through a thicket to get there whereas uh, in an agency case, um, the agency has a pathway already cleared for you as a judge. And all you have to do is defer and you can just follow that path and it's going to be really easy. And I say down the path might be a woodcock rather than a partridge, but, you know, under the circumstances, a woodcock, which is a smaller bird, is good enough. And so I... I I, I said this in a dissent in a case called Valent uh, last year. I think, unfortunately, um, on the judiciary side of things, just as an empirical matter, I think that deference is oftentimes the court's first resort rather than last. And it's, it's, it's oftentimes something that looks like reflexive. And, uh, and that, I mean, that 
even if one accepts Chevron on its terms, that has profound consequences for the rule of law if courts are just reflexively deferring to an executive agency's declaration of what the law is. Yeah, you say at the outset of the paper, um, there's nothing so liberating for a judge as the discovery of an ambiguity right. Right, to sort of frees them from doing the hard work. That's right. That's and I, And, you know, so one thing I say in the speech is once a judge finds an ambiguity, we're back to 1978 with respect to the principles of statutory construction. I mean, all the plain meaning stuff, all the stuff that that constrains a judge to a, a particular interpretation. All that stuff's out the window. And now, instead of those more objective uh, criteria, we have a bunch of uh, material or criteria that are much, much easier to manipulate, not least legislative history. And so, you know, if a judge wants to get to a certain result, uh, finding an ambiguity makes it vastly easier to do so. And so some judges give up more easily. I think this is just a fact. Some judges give up more easily uh, before they say, okay, it's ambiguous than others. I mean, for some, it's not even like a full sentence. It's a clause within a sentence. I'm thinking of actual cases I've had uh, where they just say it's ambiguous. Um, whereas other judges will work very hard to, to determine whether there's a, a best interpretation before we say the statute's ambiguous. And I think that difference between judges who work hard before, who strive not to find ambiguities, to, who strive to find the best meaning, who use, in fact, every tool of interpretation versus judges who give up easily and say it's ambiguous, that's an overlooked distinction among judges, and I think it's an important one. One of the major lessons I've learned <clears throat> working for uh, Adam is one that I, I believe he got from from his former boss, Judge Centel, who said, who insisted uh, that at all times the parties control the litigation and that the judges are are bound by the arguments that are made before them. Now, in your uh, Vanderbilt Law Review paper, the speech that you gave in Michigan, you mentioned uh, that judges have a certain obligation to seek out the right answer on their own. Do you see that uh, as, as being in any kind of contradiction with party control of litigation? Uh, if you do, how do you square the two? Sure. Well, first I'll say uh, Judge David Santel is one of the, the truly great circuit judges in the country. I think that what Judge Santel was talking about uh, holds as a general proposition. I mean, we're not going to uh, come up with arguments, for example, that the appellant has not come up with as a basis to reverse a, uh, a district court. But in cases where we are tasked with interpreting a federal statute, that is a different situation. And, and in my view, we are not going to adopt a wrong interpretation of a federal statute in a case that will bind uh, other other panels, uh, simply because a party hasn't given us quite the right interpretation. I mean, let's say let's say um, one of the parties has given us an interpretation that's eighty percent correct, but it's got a couple of things wrong, and the other party's totally wrong. We're not going to just adopt, you know, the eighty percent uh, interpretation, including the twenty percent error, simply because somebody neither party has has pointed out that error. Uh, we need, whenever we pronounce the meaning of a statute, we need to make sure that that meaning is actually the correct meaning so far as we can tell. Judge, in, in talking about the mechanics of, of oral argument and, and either judges or advocates or others are almost looking for ambiguity um, where there needn't necessarily be any, it actually called to mind uh, your other paper that we wanted to discuss, which is your, the talk you gave at NYU on Hayek. Um, you quote Hayek as saying that the, the modern, this is in the Constitution of, of Liberty, yeah. uh, the modern tendency to exaggerate this uncertainty, the uncertainty of law, uh, is part of a campaign against the rule of law. And so right. here you took the, some of the themes that you first raised in the, in the Vanderbilt paper and really expand them out to a much broader um, discussion of what's at stake in, in modern mm -hmm. government and in modern administration through the work of, of Hayek. Yeah. 
was a, was a fast, again, it was a talk you, you delivered, I guess it was last year, was it, at, at NYU? In November. Yeah, it was oh. just about five months ago. Yeah. Right. Uh, so it was, it was for uh, NYU's uh, Classical Liberal Institute, headed by our, our friend Richard Epstein. And I guess it was That's right. just just published um, as of this taping, just published in the NYU Journal of Law and Liberty. So again, yeah. encourage our listeners to, 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 to read it. But could you just give us a, a sense of what the talk was about, Judge? Yeah, well, um, I mean, maybe I'll just kind of focus on the point you just raised, yeah. which is Hayek says that uh, the, the, the most urgent necessity in, in modern times is to limit executive discretion. And he's writing in, the, in like the, the late 1950s, and he anticipates 25 years before Chevron. Uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of the developments that uh, would flow from Chevron itself, and so he's saying that the greater uh, the executive's discretion to coerce individuals, the less uh, certainty there is about the rule of law. Um, if you minimize executive discretion, and the executive can only act pursuant to laws that are clear, then then private actors can predict in advance whether their actions are lawful or unlawful. But if we're going to let statutes be ambiguous and then the executive can choose an interpretation post hoc within some range of acceptable interpretations, then it gets much harder for private actors to determine in advance whether their actions are lawful. And so what Hayek called the sphere, uh, the private sphere contracts because as a practical matter, you can't go beyond a certain uh, distance from the center without getting into the zone of discretion where based on the executives, basically arbitrary will almost, uh, Hayek would say, an action might be lawful or not lawful. Uh, Hayek, and Hayek likens the proponents of broad executive discretion. But he traces their intellectual lineage back to Hobbes. And Hobbes, of course, said, you know, we need to con- uh, consolidate all power in an executive and then allow that executive to exercise that power as he sees fit. And, and so we're just on a spectrum between Hobbes and between Locke, the limited government envisioned by Locke. And, th- and to the extent the administrative state and its doctrines are enhancing executive discretion, it's moving us towards Hobbes. Uh, just a few years ago, uh, Richard Epstein uh, wrote in National Affairs, AEI's journal, uh, he wrote about this problem of government by waiver, where the more discretion the executive has, the more it sort of turns government on its head, where it's not sort of limited government and free people, but limited people and free government. And the people have to constantly seek the approval, sort of the waiver of, of otherwise general laws, they have to seek these waivers from the government just to be able to do what they're going to do. And you explore that a little bit in, in your, your own talk. You point out that there are those uh, scholars and others who, who think this is a feature, not a bug, but actually it's a, it's, it's a real bug and something that needs to be fixed. But even more than that, more fundamentally, what you just pointed to, it goes back to the framers' vision of, of stability, right? Stability in government, not just energy, but also stability, steady administration of the laws and so on, so that people could just organize their lives, mm-hmm. what the law is, and, yeah. and, and do, it, um, do what they're going to do, rather than just constantly being whipsawed back and forth between uh, changing con- you know, executive conceptions of what the law means on a given day. Yes. And uh, I mean, the waiver point is interesting. That's sort of a nascent practice. And it's, it, I mean, <laughs> it's almost amusing the, to hear the proponents of the administrative state uh, say that, that waivers are great, you know, because they allow people to take actions that they couldn't take otherwise. Well, I mean, Hayek, Hayek, just anticipated so many of the the rationales that would be offered in in support of the administrative state. And he anticipated this one too. And he said that actually government by waiver is a terrible, terrible thing because it moves us away from the definition of a free society 
and towards the definition of a command and control society. So a free society, uh, anything that is not expressly prohibited is permitted. In a command and control society, um, everything that is not expressly permitted is prohibited. And so when you have a uh, when you have a statute that generally prohibits a lot of stuff, but then the executive can give you a waiver, permission, specific permission to do something, where it just moves us towards a, an unfree society where you can't do anything unless you have specific permission. In some ways, or so often, the critics of some of these aspects of the administrative state, they're criticized as being sort of anarcho-libertarian, right, against against law and regulation, when in fact the argument that Hayek is making, the argument you made, is an argument for law instead of this other thing, which is really less law than it is just arbitrary will of a, of a particular executive. Um, yeah, um, I mean, Hayek, Hayek said that it's precisely when a problem is complex that we need to, to resolve that problem by drawing upon all of the information that is in the hands of individual actors based on their own circumstances, rather than the much more limited information available to a central planner. Uh, so when, when something's really complicated, you have to harness that information, which means you lay down general rules of conduct and then allow individual decision makers to take whatever action they think is going to uh, be most productive in meeting society's needs rather than have the government tell them what action they can take. Uh, I, you know, I, the proponents of the administrative state just sort of beg the question whether this is the only way you can run a modern free society. You, you had a great line uh, recently in an opinion in a very different context. It was a multi-district litigation uh, opinion. Um, and, and, but you focusing on, on the way a lower court had, had grappled with some, some issues in that proceeding, you said, uh, you wrote, but MDLs, multi-district litigation cases are not some kind of judicial border country where the rules are few and the rule of law rarely makes an appearance. And when I saw that, it really jumped out at me as having real echoes as well for these questions about administration. Where yeah, no, it's just exact same, law. it's, it's the same debate, just different venue. Uh, I have great respect for the district judge in that case. Let me yeah. say that. But for in MDLs generally, the growing argument is that there are so many cases in these MDLs, multi-district litigation, that we simply can't have we, the, the civil rules of procedure, which are law, simply can't apply in those cases. And so these rules of process that are designed to ensure that the parties are treated fairly we simply can't, they're just not practicable in these complex cases. So, which, which actually constitute 40% of the cases in federal court. So 40% of the cases in federal court, the argument goes, uh, we can't have the rule of law. It's just not practicable. That's the same argument that in some circles we hear for the administrative state. Separation of powers, it's just not practicable. Uh, Hobbes based his uh, theory of government on perceived necessity. He was writing during a civil war and he said, it's just essential. It's just necessary that we concentrate all this power in the executive. And so his, some of his intellectual descendants are saying, based on the necessities of our time, we just can't have the rule of law in these different areas. It's just, it's just too much trouble. Now, there are some statutes that require some work to interpret. Of course, there are also some constitutional provisions that are written in, we'll say, in challenging ways, challenging for judges and challenging for all of us. Hayek, in, in, the, the other Hayekian theme you grapple with in, in your NYU talk was the question of unenumerated rights and, and the Ninth uh, Amendment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Judge Robert Bork once famously analogized uh, the Ninth Amendment to an inkblot in the sense that it's not self-evident what exactly the meaning was underlying mm -hmm. it. Um, but can you give us uh, your own sense of, of how judges ought to go about working with the Ninth Amendment? Uh, well, I agree with what Michael McConnell said. I think that, I mean, so Hayek says that the Ninth Amendment was meant to, to, to usher in a continuation of basically the British common law 
and the protection of liberty uh, uh, through the doctrines uh, embodied in that case law and just, you know, and just sort of a continuation, which would be parallel to the case law of the enumerated rights. Um, Historically, I just don't think that's right um, for some of the reasons that uh, Mike McConnell points out. Um, but so the Ninth Amendment, I, I think the historical evidence, and I really would point folks towards Michael McConnell's uh, Law Review or, uh, article about the Ninth Amendment, which actually was a transcript of his Hayek lecture back in like 2005. Um, but uh, I you know, when you enumerate rights, there's an implication that you don't care very much about others. And there was uh, some expressed concern along those lines during the, the drafting of the Bill of Rights. And so McConnell makes the point that uh, the Ninth Amendment uh, is probably best understood historically to rebut the inference that folks otherwise might draw from the enumeration. Uh, and so Yes, these other unenumerated liberties, which were traditionally protected at, at British and then American common law, yes, they are not enumerated, but you should not assume that we don't care about them at all. Uh, we're not indifferent about them, even though they don't have express constitutional protection. And so McConnell says that nets out to basically a clear statement rule that if positive law in, uh, by Congress is going to infringe upon a liberty traditionally protected at common law, but not enumerated in the Bill of Rights. Uh, the, 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 the statute needs to make clear its intention to do so. Otherwise, it should be construed not to do so. I think I, I was an early American history major. Um, I, I happen to think that Professor McConnell has the history right on that. And, and I, so that's, that's how I think it ought to be interpreted. It's a little bit different from Bork. It's quite different from Hayek. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's, that's what I would say. You mentioned in, in this paper that as an originalist and textualist, which you say are really the same thing, and I'm not going to dispute that, that you do not think that Hayek's conception of the rule of law should uh, guide the court's determination of what the law is. Now, on a, in a certain sense, that's uh, kind of obvious because Hayek was not a framer of the Constitution. It lived well after the Constitution was uh, adopted. But if, in fact, uh, the Constitution was meant to put in law certain values uh, set forth, for instance, in our Declaration of Independence, right? If the, the Constitution was meant to concretize a classical liberal conception of the aims of government, uh, why should his uh, conception of the rule of law and its implications for uh, the, the extent of unenumerated rights, why should that come into conflict with originalism or uh, and textualism? Well, I guess uh, I think if, if one reads the written Constitution, uh, I don't think that we can fairly say that the document itself, as it would have been understood publicly at the time, it, uh, elevates class all basically the whole body of classical liberalism to a constitutional value many many principles of classical liberalism are reflected there all the framers all of them the federalists and the anti-federalists alike all of them were classical liberals they just disagreed about means about exactly how to implement these things but to the extent i mean and so you know we have the separation of powers we have limited government. You know, we had uh, uh, the legislature only having enumerated powers. And, and you know, as those were understood by the public at the time, the Commerce Clause power sure did not extend to regulation of manufacture. It extended to regulation of movement of goods. Um, and so, I mean, there's a lot of overlap, but I think when we get to the point of Lochner type principles, which as a classical liberal, we can, many people can support. Um, but when we get to that point, those specific values 
are, I don't see where they are embodied uh, in, in the written constitution, uh, partly because I don't see them in the ninth amendment. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it, it embodies a lot of classical liberalism, but not all of it. And I think if we're going to be principled in our application of a formalist interpretive methodology, we can't go beyond the values that a, that, that the public would have ascribed at the time to the law that bound them. Judge, you've been so generous with your time. Why don't we finish by coming back to the very beginning of this with your book. Um, again, the title of the book was Lead Yourself First. Um, reading the book and thinking about our conversation, um, it occurred to me this morning that in some ways the book could have been called Govern Yourself First, right? That in so many ways the the virtues and, and the ethics um, that you and, and, and Michael explore in this book they're not just about leading others, although it's important. It's also about governing yourself, right? Whether it's controlling, maintaining your emotional balance, structuring your thinking, making it more rigorous, um, and thinking through some of these other conversations I knew we'd have about administration and the rule of law and government. Um, I was brought back to this basic point that that I've explored in, in some writings lately, and Tal and I have talked about a lot, about those those sort of virtues or or what do you want to call them ethics that are necessary for a free people to govern themselves, right? Mm-hmm. To be patient with the work of democracy, patient um, mm-hmm. with the rule of law, um, to really submit themselves to both self-government under the rule of law. And I'm wondering, am I, am I reading too much into this book or would you agree that, that, <laughs> that you know, some of the, some of the themes that you explore, they go beyond just sort of preparing for leadership, but also for sort of, nourishing the, the the roots of democracy yeah no i think that's a great point and i would embrace that as an implication of the book um i guess to focus on a couple of things i i, I have this working definition of character that i've used for years which is see the right thing and then do it and and both of those things are hard uh when you want to do uh, something that really isn't the right thing. You know, we tend to convince ourselves that the thing we want to do is the right thing to do. A lot of times it isn't. And if we're soft headed, we can fail the character test at that first step. Uh, and then sometimes we see the right thing to do, but it's really hard. And, and so that takes, uh, a, you know, discipline and strength to execute doing that right thing. Um, I think that lesson can also apply to national character that, that we have to, we have to be reflective rather than emotive about seeing the right thing to do, the right decisions for the country to make. Uh, one concern I have now is that it's much more emotion and less, less reflection, uh, deliberation that drives our debate on, on policy questions. And, and then we just seem to, to sometimes lack the will to, to carry through something that reflective people, uh, maybe even a consensus of reflective people would, would say we need to do. Relatedly, uh, on the point of emotional balance, I mean, and I, we mentioned this in the, in the introduction, one thing that seems to be absent to a large extent uh, in our sort of national dialogue is grace. Um, it's one thing I've seen in the last 20 years is just this propensity for ad hominem argument. Uh, you know, there was some 25 years ago, but now it's just almost reflexive. It's like the first thing people do is say that, you know, anyone who offered, somebody offers an opinion, they disagree with it. And they say the person's corrupt, they're bought and paid for, all this other stuff. They don't really engage with the ideas. And I think we just need to, to try to be more respectful of our fellow citizens uh, and to, to have more magnanimity towards people we disagree with. I've always thought that you can never judge a person's character by his or her politics. Um, I know, <laughs> I mean, just so many good, good people 
who voted for Walter Mondale um, or, you know, vote differently than I do. And so I just know it, it's not about character. Uh, and we need to stop seeing policy differences as about character. And I mean, this is kind of what we talk about at one point of the book. When you, somebody is acting in a way you don't like, you want to you wanna reflect on the reasons why. And a lot of times you find out those reasons have nothing to do with you. And sometimes those reasons create sympathy for that other person. And I think we need to, to try to bring that spirit to our discussions with people who disagree and, and try to have some grace towards people who disagree. Grace and reasoned, uh, reasoned discourse rather than emotion and superficiality an ad hominem uh, attacks. And solitude is the foundation for that more reflective, grace-filled dialogue rather than what social media has been leading us toward. Well, what a wonderful note on which to end. Again, our guest for this episode has been Judge Raymond Kethledge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. His book, co-authored with Michael S. Irwin, is Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. We'd encourage all of our listeners to read the book or at least look up the articles and other materials we've discussed today. And please join us again next time for another episode of Unprecedential. Unprecedental.